Connection is our ability to really connect the dots around self, family, and career, and look at our life holistically. Because we really only have one life. We don't have our work life and our home life. We have our life. And how do the various aspects of our life come together? Now, I don't want anyone to throw their dessert at me when I say this next thing. But I really don't believe that New Year's resolutions work. And I don't believe they work for a couple of key reasons. One, they're based on our shoulds. Remember those? And number two, they're often set out of context of our whole life. There's something arbitrary that we pick and say, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to go to the gym three times a week, whatever it is. And we know that they don't work because if we're regular gym goers in January, whoo, is it ever busy in there? And by February, it's pretty much back to normal. But what does work, though, is creating a life theme. And what a life theme is, is your overriding intention, your overriding objective for the year that encapsulates your whole life, looks at the areas, the combination of self, family, and career. And what do you want that year to be about? And the idea behind the life theme is not to make it long, but to make it short, whether it's five words or less, preferably if you can get it down to, to two or even one word that signifies what is your overriding intention for the year. And so for example, a few years ago, we had, my, my son was about eight, 18, 18 months old, we had moved to a new home. Oh, well, the home wasn't new. It needed lots of renovations. We moved to a new house in a new neighborhood. And I was relatively new in, in my coaching business. And as I started thinking about, you know, what is it that I want to accomplish this year? It started to become clear to me that the things I wanted to accomplish were around, well, I wanted to understand the, I wanted to get to know my neighbors on my new street. I wanted to find out what other children were around that were similar age to Adam. I wanted to understand where he was going to go to preschool. I wanted to get to know more about the community that I lived in. I wanted to understand and get to know more coaches who were doing similar kind of work to me. And it became clear to me that what my overriding intention or my theme for the coming year was about was creating community. When I started to connect all the pieces, the overriding theme became creating community. A few years later, I was in a place where I was uh, three quarters of the way through writing, writing the book. We were in the middle of a, the never-ending renovations of my home. We're still doing them. But at this point, we were in the middle of a living room renovation. And I had some tough conversations that I needed to have with my dad. And so as I began to think about that and looking for the connectivity between all of those things, it became clear to me that my theme for that year was about completion. I had a lot of things that I had to finish, and I needed to focus on that. And that's really what your overriding intention or your theme does for you. It gives you a focal point. And it's not saying that you know if something new comes in. You just want to register it against that theme. And if it fits, you do it for the year. If it doesn't fit, it's not saying that you're never going to do it. You just may table it for next year and say, that's something that I can do next year, because this year needs to be about this. I used to come from a place of, of being more of a, a lone ranger, where I really felt that yeah, I'm a competent woman. I can find my answers. I can get the job done. And if by chance I might reach out and ask for support or help, that maybe I am somehow saying that I'm not capable. And you know, I now and, and I really believe that that was a lot of that had to do with being caught up with that whole control thing. And now I have the opposite point of view, and I really believe that the stronger and broader and deeper that we can weave our support networks, the easier our life becomes. And the closer we get to balance. And we want to be looking at, how do we make that happen? How do we make that happen? And for some of us, this idea of networking has a pretty bad rap. 
How many people like networking? I just want to get a sense of that. Some people love it, some people don't. Yeah, OK. And the reason it's a turn off for some people, it's like this. It's like someone, you, you walk into a room, and someone comes up to you and go, here's my card. <laughs> You're going, I don't even know this person. A lot of us don't like that. A lot of us don't like that. If you're more extroverted, you might find the idea of walking into a room and not knowing anyone kind of fun. If you're more on the introverted side, that'll scare you half to death. Your palms will be sweating. Your stomach's going to be turning. And I think that part of the challenge comes is because it's got this idea of networking about trying to go out there and meet these people that we don't even, that we don't even know. Some of us might have had negative experiences where it feels like someone's wanting to get something from you. Some of this idea of networking is about uh, mutual, reciprocal relationships. You know, what can, what can I do for you? What can you do for me? But I, I take it even one step further in thinking about it in a different light. And how many, uh, have you ever heard of a book called Work the Pond? Anyone ever read that book? Yeah. It's called Work the Pond, The Power of Positive Networking, and it was written by a couple of good friends of mine. And the way that they describe and look at networking is coming at it from the perspective of finding out what you can do for someone else. Finding out how you can help someone else. Not necessarily about how they can help you. That is a whole different mindset and a different approach. And it isn't about once you find out what you can do for them to immediately find out what they can do for you. Not to worry about that at all. And just to know karmically somewhere down the road something's going to show up to help you and support you because you've made the effort to find out how you can help someone else. That's a lot more relaxing way of going out and connecting with people if your mission is to find out how you can help them. Yeah? And Judy and Gail say this, and they say this, and it stuck with me, and I want to repeat it uh, to you. What if the most important person in your life is someone you haven't met yet. You know, what if the most important person in your life is someone you haven't met yet? And they, they tell this story. This is not my story. This is their story. They tell this story about this woman who's standing at a grocery store a cash register, you know, Safeway or something. And she's kind of fumbling with her, with her wallet, and her change is falling out, and, and she's in distress. And the, the gentleman behind her says, are, are, are you OK? Is there anything I can do for you? And she says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just a mess. My uh, child has leukemia, and we're having a really hard time finding a donor match. And he says to her, well, maybe I'm a match. And as it turned out, he was a match. And this little girl lived. Imagine if they'd never had that interaction or that, that conversation. You know, so imagine if the most important person in your life is someone you haven't met yet. 